Gig Gab, episode 341 for Monday, March 28th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here, back here, finally, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. Kent? I'm well. Oh. I am well. We had a good weekend. The band did its first club g- date in a long time hmm. at one of, one of our home base clubs, and it was a great homecoming vibe to it. And nice. It, it, it was a really nice thing. And I got to say, you know, we have a couple of changes in our band over the last years. We replaced our bass player, and now we've replaced our drummer. And you know, sometimes there's a what's it called when you when you you know spin gold out of nothing? Um, alchemy. Alchemy. I don't know. Maybe that's it. That's the word. Sure. And uh, uh, you know, you're you're used to hearing your band in a certain way, and then you get some fresh guys in there, new guys. And there's nothing against the old guys, of course. It's just uh, the, nope. the way the universe works is yep. sometimes the magical combination of different hands on different instruments and, you know, uh, the slightest change to vibe or the biggest change to vibe and groove just makes everything seem fresh. And that, that's kind of how I'm feeling. I'm, I have, that's good. I've been enjoying the rehearsals so much. I've been, we pulled, I think we played five new songs on, uh, on Saturday. Nice. And three of the five were like, crushed and two of them still need some work but you know i needed to get a play in on them to get a little repetition so everybody can hear what everybody else is doing on them Re- reps um, are reps are the key man yep <laughs> yeah yeah that's great i'm glad to hear that uh, that's good yeah. yeah well you know you know you know don you met don right our drummer yeah yeah, yeah. super guy yep. super duper guy great player great great guy and a great player yep and, and i'll add to that great band guy ah, right so yeah, you know there are people that. who are good guys But this guy is just so enthusiastic, so present with his enthusiasm. You watch him play, and he's just a joy to watch. I mean, he's got a huge smile on his face. He brings a very unique vibe. And, uh, yes, super player. You know, very active on social media, already reposting our stuff. He clearly is a band guy. Again, band guy is a – you know what I mean when I say band guy, right? I do. Yeah, yeah, team player. Huge team player, yeah. Yeah. So no, I I can yeah. tell because he he was playing with Simon one night when yeah. I was in Los Gatos with my wife in the Bay Area with my wife uh, back in the fall, and he was super gracious to let me sit in, and then had like ve- like he sat and watched and had very like specific compliments to share. I, he was like you could just tell this is like this is a, a good human and wants to help everybody else, like raise everybody else up, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. A musician's musician. I yeah. Would say. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, that's great. Anyway, I'm glad, that, man. That's, that's my big re- reflection. You know, I did, I played Friday night acoustic show with our good friend, Chris Breen and Joe Rizzi on drums and, oh, nice. and uh, Dave Rieger on bass. And that's a cool, different vibe. I'm just at a point of great gratitude. The different sides of the, of the art that I try to express all are kind of getting great outlets, both up, where I used to live and have a vibrant musical life and down here as the gigs are rolling in, you know, I, I've expressed on the show, like, Oh man, what have I done? You know, like you know, <laughs> I've been a little perplexed about where, where everything was going and then everything was shut down. And uh, just, you know, I get to play solo acoustic gigs and play quiet stuff and I get to play acoustic rock gigs, you know, yeah. with some really nice people. I've got a duo down here. I've got a trio down here and I get to play with my friend Mel you know, and which is a, a bonding experience that I'm very grateful for. So, you know, sometimes music can be frustrating and sometimes music can be a little soul sucking, you know, because you're what you're what you're striving for for yourself it sometimes seems unattainable. Whatever that is, you know, musical proficiency, quantity of gigs, quality of gigs, quality of people you play, whatever that whatever your your goals are, sometimes it seems just out of grasp. But sometimes all the stars line up and it's uh, and your musical life is incredibly fulfilling. That's where I am right now. That's amazing. I, that I'm, I'm stoked. This is great. Like I couldn't have imagined a better 
outcome for all of the sort of circumstances that, that you've been navigating through. This is great. Yeah, it's good, man. And the funny thing is, you know, like the people who listen to the show, what you don't know is that Dave gets my wine fest pre-show often. <laughs> like, you know, whatever I've stored up for the week of stuff that's frustrated me, you know, Dave will get that. And, and um, yes, he's a very bright guy. Yes, he's a very good musician. He actually is a pretty decent amateur psychologist as well. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Well, some uh, of the time, you know. <laughs> Well, you've been very helpful to me. And so, you know, part of part of the reason I'm in such a good, happy place is some of the great advice you give me. And, you know, well, I'm glad it makes it into the show. Yeah. I mean, and it, yeah, so. it does make it into the show. It often does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's some personal things that aren't appropriate to share in the show for, for right. obvious reasons. But but yeah, a lot of it we like to we like to get in there. Speaking of of personal things, there's something that I have. I'll, not intentionally avoided talking about in the show. And I, I wanted to mention it because it very much has impacted my playing. I talked a few weeks ago about how I played that gig after we had that ice storm and I, you know, had like shoveled during the ice storm or whatever. And, and like couldn't hold the stick in my left hand as well as I normally could. It turns out that really wasn't from the shoveling. Um, it turns, I have uh, these lipomas, all over my body, which are just these fatty deposits that sort of sit in between the layers of skin. When they first, when I first noticed them, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, I thought, oh my gosh, I have cancer, right? And yeah, and yeah. so that was a fun afternoon. But uh, it turns out I don't, um, or at least not, those aren't cancer. And and I don't I don't know that I have cancer. I'm just saying that, you know, there, there could be cancer brewing that I don't know about. Like these, that's, that's just the thing. But um I've had a few of these taken out over the years, as I've mentioned on the show, right? I had one kind of on the bottom of my leg that I had taken out on the day of a gig because it was driving me crazy. And thankfully, my surgeon's a guitar player and he knows, uh, you know, he understands. <laughs> but um, it turns out that I've got a few of these, two specifically, in my left arm that are pressing right on, and I might get it wrong, but the either radial or ulnar nerve and especially when my elbow is bent 90 degrees, they really press on it. And that is what has been causing uh, these problems. And now that I'm aware of it, I can look back probably three years, Paul, and and tell you that I have been compensating for this, you know, over as these things have grown. Mm. Yeah. It, and so, like, it's gotten to the point where gigs and band rehearsals are these frustrating things for me. Because my left hand just won't do what I know that it can do. Uh, because of my travels, I was not able to get in with my surgeon uh, before I traveled. But I, I do have uh, an appointment Wednesday. It should be quick. I mean, it should be, you know, an hour or less to get mm -hmm. these these three things taken out. And I could have had it done before I went away with a different surgeon. I've been really – I've never had them removed from my arms before. I have lots of them in my arms. Uh, but I've never had them removed because they've never really bothered me. And I'm also a little bit, you know, like there's a lot of little things that are going on in the arms. It's very different than pulling them out of like, you know, the fat of my butt, right? You know, that's not so much a big deal. But, you know, slicing into my arms is a thing I'm a little nervous about. I, I As I told my, my doctor's uh, assistant – I'm certain everybody at the practice could do this, that this is trivial. However, I'm going to go with the guy I trust. So, um, so I go Wednesday and I'm, I'm, e it's been messing with my head, just not being able to play the way that I know that my hands can play. Um, so I I'm eager to, to move past this. I'm hoping and assuming that as soon as this is out, things will begin to recover. There may be a little bit of, uh, strength to recover in, in my hands um, and in my arm. But I, I think, I think as soon as this, this pressure is not on that nerve, cause I can move the things around. And when I move it out of the way, it's like instantly better. So I, I think we're doing the right one. I actually went and met with a physical therapist to help me really make sure that I'm pulling the right ones out. And so, yeah, but it's just, it's been, um, I don't know why I haven't mentioned it on the show, probably because I don't like to think about it, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> but, um, no, I get it. Yeah. But, you know, we get to the point, I, this is an interesting conversation because I've been thinking a lot about what it means as you get to be an older musician, right? So yeah. I want to do what I'm doing as long as I can. I have a trigger finger in one of my fingers. Oh. It freaks me out every once in a while. And, you know, and sometimes I feel a little bit of weakness in my hands and I'm like, oh man, is, you know, are we starting that, that decline into, you know, where stuff that you 
maybe can't just fix with a surgery or something like that. Yeah, and so, right. But the message is take care of what you can take care of yeah. while you can take care of it. Right. I, I wish I had, it, as I, as, and I'm sure I know I've said this with every one of these lipomas I've had taken out. I wish I realized it was causing me problems, you know, years ago, but yeah, what, it, what, even what you could have gotten back out of that. Yeah. I, I, but it's just, I don't know, even, even knowing this, I, like, it takes me a little while with each of them to realize, oh, that's what it is, y you know. So anyway, that's this. That's on this week for me. So I'm excited about it. I'll I'm be a little... thinking about you. Yeah, you know, get get taken care of and get yeah. back to where you need to be. But yeah. uh, you know, good for you to get it to get it looked at. Yeah, and, yeah. And hopefully. hopefully, try and retrain your brain that you should think about it instead of not I, think about it. I part, do it's part of your life, and you got to address it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you're totally right. Um, I was at South by Southwest. I have some a bunch of bands that I saw. I want to talk about a couple of them. Um, I saw a couple more music related movies that I want to mention. But the first thing that I want to talk about that I don't really want to talk about, but I want to talk about because I've had a really hard time processing this is what we found out on Friday night um, mm. about Taylor Hawkins passing away. I was at, actually at a I was in L.A. at a sort of business dinner. Uh, it was a backbeat dinner and Lisa, my wife works for us at backbeat and she was there and I kind of looked across at the table at her and I could tell something was wrong. I'm like, is everything okay? She's like, yeah, it's fine. And I asked her again a couple minutes later. I'm like, what's up? She's like, Taylor Hawkins died. It's like, it, I, I thought she was talking about a different Taylor Hawkins. Right. Like, right. It was, it was like, guy, yeah. what are you, what? Like, this doesn't make any sense. And, uh, and so I've, I've really had a hard time just, I haven't posted anything online about it because I don't know what to say. Uh, I kind of, you know, decided that we'd talk about it here and and try and process this. But, you know, as as the news has evolved over the weekend, that what I feared was the case appears to be the case that, you know, it um, that it has to do potentially with an overdose or something like that. I mean, he he has struggled with drugs you know, and it, and what seems like addiction, I don't want to, I don't want to put the wrong things out there, but you know, 21 years in 2001, he OD'd and was in a coma for, you know, multiple days, if not a week. Mm. And I know that uh, he had come out after that and said, okay, that's my rock bottom. And I'm going to, you know, turn things around. And I think for a while he did. And I don't, I have no knowledge of, it, you know, when he you know, when, when that started to falter, it could be that it just started to falter the other night. I mean, it doesn't take much, but, um, you know, they said there were 10 drugs in his system from the tox report and, and at least a few of those were tricyclic antidepressants. So uh, as much as I feel for his family, you know, his wife and his kids and his friends, and obviously for his bandmates and the Foo Fighters, I also feel really bad just for him because it, you know, I don't think my guess is he was not taking tricyclic antidepressants recreationally. You know, that right. that's generally the sign of someone who is aware of an issue and, and working on it and battling it. And, um, and he lost that battle. It sounds like, um, in one way or another, uh, and I just like, it brings up, it brings up the conversation about addiction um, which is, you know, the more we can change and remove the stigma about it. I mean, it is a disease as a friend of mine, a couple of weeks ago, obviously prior to all this said, said to me, and he's a recovering, uh, addict. And he said, all right, I'm trying not to call people addicts. He's recovering from addiction, right? Cause it's a disease. Yeah. It's not him. It's, it's a disease that he suffers from. And he said, yeah, it's a disease that lies to you in your own voice. And I mm. thought, what a fascinating way to, to paint that. Uh, because it's, it really, it, you know, just like if you, you know, if you fell and broke your arm, it's not, I mean, maybe it's your fault you fell, but you, you know, I mean, it, let's say it's not, you know, it's, it's something that happened to you and, and you work to get it fixed, but a broken arm doesn't tell you it doesn't need to be fixed. You yeah. know, whereas addiction very much tells you it doesn't need to be fixed and you believe yeah. yourself when you hear your own voice, it, you know, and it's, it's tough. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I know I'm not alone, but you know, I have several people who are very close to me who suffer from addiction. It's, it's not my story to tell, but 
It, it's I'm I'm very much and over the last couple of years have been trying really hard to figure out and change the way I think about it because it's super easy to get frustrated and that's normal and it's super easy to get angry and that's normal, but it's directing that anger that I've been working on because it's, you know, it seems like it's someone's choice to use and it's not when it's at that point, they are, you know, the, the choice is being made by the disease, not by them, even though it seems like yeah. it's made, being made by them. Right. You know, it's so that just, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, he was a fantastic drummer. Uh, he, I, I, and we actually, in the temptation to go down and, and just really talk about disease and that type of stuff, I, yeah. I would rather think about him as that manimal, you know, oh, that, that's yeah. the picture in my head. Like, like literally the, the most interesting conversation, is there anyone else that you would put behind a kit when Dave Grohl is in your band? Can no. You think of anybody else, right? No, and even but even he and I hadn't heard this before, but I've I've seen some reports this weekend that said that, you know, he he kind of suffered from imposter syndrome. Like, how how can I I'm not good enough to to be in Dave Grohl's band? It's like, well, dude, you you're bit you're a better drummer than Dave Grohl. You know, that like that. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just knock that one out right away. You know, Dave and Dave's a fantastic drummer. Taylor is a better drummer, was a better drummer than Dave Grohl. Uh and, you know, he's a big Rush fan, as was Dave Grohl, and, or as is Dave Grohl. And so, you know, there, there, was, there was that element of it, too. But he was just, in addition to being a fantastic drummer, he was such a, pre and a fantastic singer, by the way, uh, great lead vocalist, really, you know, great harmony vocalist, too. Uh, he, was, he was just a, a force of joy behind the kit. Yeah. At least that's how it came across, right? You, you know, it, I, obviously there's more to the, to, to the story and to his struggles than, than came across any time he was at the drums. He was like all smiles, all energy, pushing through every gig, just playing his heart out. And a super nice guy. I, I think I talked on this show about how I actually got to chat with him and Pat Smear once. Um, it was, they played the Foo Fighters played at an Apple event. It was like, you were like 200 people there or something. Tim Cook was announcing, I don't know, whatever the new iPad was or some silly thing, you know, uh, not that iPads are silly, but you know, they had the Foo Fighters play. And, uh, then we went to the hands-on room afterwards and the Foo Fighters were there and Dave was off like hobnobbing with Tim Cook, but I ran into Taylor Hawkins and Pat Smear and was chatting with them. And I asked something, Taylor was playing like rods or something for that gig because it was a small room and one of the rods, one of the pieces of a rod had like broken off and hit Dave in the back and I saw Dave like give him a look at the gig. So I asked about that and he's like, yeah, he's like, there was something. He's like, I didn't even notice it happened. He's like, but yeah, Dave kind of looked at me like, you know, something happened <laughs> and and uh, he's like, but it's all good. You know, we kind of have this rapport and Pat starts shaking his head like these two guys, he's like never he's like my advice to you never be in a band with two drummers he's like it's just like <laughs> and he was obviously like you know in jest but but there was a little truth there and and uh and i i said to him i said well i'm also a drummer and he's like oh what is it a conspiracy here he's like i can't get away from you people but yeah it like i i feel i i can't imagine what dave Grohl is going through right now because those guys were so, and you you would see it if you saw them live too. Like it, they are they were so tight and locked yeah. in together. Um, yeah, he he was. Um, I I loved watching him play. You know, hearing him play, hearing him sing, just a fantastic guy. Um, and and a really it's a nice sad guy story. Too. It's sad. He will be man. missed. Yeah, it is very sad. He will be missed. And and uh, I don't know. Do you think? Do you think? the Foo Fighters will continue on or is this the type of thing with a band where people are that tight where you say, uh, I don't know, you know, wouldn't be the same. It won't be the same. I can't, I, I can't imagine the Foo Fighters without Taylor and Dave in the band. The other people in the band, I would say are, were replaceable, but the two of them, from my perspective, having seen the band several times, I can't imagine it now. I mean, you know, I couldn't imagine the Beatles without George Harrison. And yet, you know, when, when we were watching those the stones, the stones without Charlie, well, the stones aren't the stones without Charlie. I, I have a, I have a tangent to share about that. It, this came to me this weekend. I think if the stones play, if Mick and Keith and Ronnie 
play again together, it should be, they should call it the stones, not the Rolling Stones. Like the mm. stones with an evening of Rolling Stones music, right? Because mm. without Charlie, it's not the Rolling Stones. Um, so I kind of feel the same way, but I which, think. Which takes nothing away from Steve Jordan, who's. Oh, no, no, no. Amazing. Oh, yeah. But it's, we're talking about icons here. Correct. Correct. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, no, Steve Jordan. I mean, the dude's a friggin' monster. Ar arguably a better drummer than Charlie Watts if, you know, we're, we're going to, like, go through all that, but not the same drummer as Charlie Watts, and that's the difference, right? right? You know, but, like, when, and when George started to quit in, uh, in the Get Back sessions, and Lennon's first comment was, well, I guess we call Eric. You know, it's like, that was shocking to me to think that there would have been a different member of the Beatles that's kind of how things go. Things evolve in bands. You know, you, yep. your, your band has different members than it did when this show started. So, you know, yep. it, it happens. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. And also, you know, Dave Grohl um, has lost most of his hearing. He's like, I think almost fully deaf in one ear and like, you know, has 30% of his hearing left in the other kind of thing. So I, like, I don't know how much longer he can do what he's doing. He's not someone who uses in ears, so you know if that's a if that's an endorsement for protecting your hearing, please take it as one. Um, so you know, I, how much longer did they have anyway? I don't know. I don't know, but it's um, anything we can do to remove the stigma around addiction and and really, I uh, you know, uh, a friend of mine commented, and he didn't mean it this way, but you know, he commented. After, as we were talking about the, the Taylor Hawkins thing, he said, drugs are bad. And I thought, man, <laughs> what a, like, it's, it's a, it's a nice trite saying it's a, it was actually a, a, a reference to a South Park joke, which made me feel better about it. But it's like, man, you know, that's one step away, one very close step away from saying, you know, people who use drugs are bad. And that's the last thing you want to say to somebody who is having a, who is struggling with not using drugs, you know? Yeah. And so I, I, I don't know. I'm super sensitive to this, but you know, um, hopefully, hopefully for good, for, for a you good hope, cause. Yeah. You hope whenever one of these horrible things happen, you know, there's some light bulb over some people. Yeah. You know, and that the legacy is that it ended up, Saving lives as well. So yeah, we they, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So hey, speaking of, wait, wait, I got to okay, yeah, jump go. in here because you brought up something I wasn't even prepared to tell you, but I have to tell you. Yeah, go. I just did a whole show with ears. Congratulations. I know. Amazing. I know. Both three, ears in all show. All show. So yeah, this see, that's started amazing. I don't three, even three don't gigs ago. Wow. And uh, the first gig I got about. 65, 70% of the show done. And then stage volumes were just going different places. Yep. Next show, I got a little bit farther and we tweaked a few things. And in this last show, a club date and whole beginning to end, it was indoors. It was a, indoors. Cause that's the hardest joy. place. Yeah. It was a joy for 80% of the show. Again, the thing that is hard is things change over the course of the night and yes. they change differently. And you get a little, um, uh, here's a good one. We play Pump It Up by Elvis Costello, right? right. And uh, the way that we play that is uh, the drums do that little vampy thing longer until I count in the bass. Okay. And the drums were louder and the bass wasn't loud enough and I couldn't hear if the bass player started his riff. And I have to do a riff and then the whole band kicks in and, and that type of thing. So once that happened and I realized I would, you know, I – you, then your brain goes to, oh crap! I'm lost. The potential, yeah. the potential for being lost is is here. So that's when when uh, one came out, and you know, but but we we tweaked it a little bit more. And I got to say, you know, I should probably have Bill on the show a couple times, but he, um, the drums sound freaking fantastic. I never can't hear the groove. That's great. Um, but mostly it's uh, it's it's the rest of the rhythm section that changes a little bit over the night. And, you know, it's been suggested to me that I should have the QMix app, you know, and do it myself as we go. Yeah. It's hard when you're the front man. You are, you are, you know, just, I can't tear myself away from fronting the band in order to make some tweaks and to hear the tweaks and, you know, those types of things. So 
uh, but Bill and I are getting good eye contact and he's checking in on me quite a bit. And we, you know, like even in this last gig where I had him a whole, a whole, he checked in on me. You could see that I was a little bit distressed yep. and, um, came up, we fixed it and I got through the whole show. So amazing. After how many years is it? I've been whining about, you know, not being able to get it. And now I could see that it's great. And one of the reasons I've been, um, I've been very, very focused on it is, I have a lot of gigs back to back and I need to be able to get out of a house rocker gig and be able to sing the next morning or the next afternoon. Yeah, And that's, uh, that's where we are. Amazing. Oh, congratulations, Amazing. man. That's yep. the best news. That's, ah, that, I'm glad. I'm super glad. I'm super glad. Yep. yep. Yeah. You There's get hope. 10, 10 of those gigs under your belt and then, then you're there. Right. Like, you know, that's the, I was talking to the fling guys about this cause we're, we've got some gigs coming up and, Two of them are on in ears, essentially for the first time. They've we've done one gig since they moved to in ears, and um, and they were talking about adding other things. And I'm like, they, just other elements to the gig, like me. Oh, should we have like a? This is going to be a fun special gig. Should we have a backup singer for this song and this that and the other thing? And I'm like, um, hey, just FYI, this is going to be your second or third gig using in ears. Think about how much more complexity you don't want to add right now because you really aren't as comfortable as you think you are in the rehearsal room with in ears. It's totally different live. You know, the stakes are higher. Like you said, the flow is moves much faster. You can't just be like, hey, I got to stop and I got to fix the." You know, I mean, you can, but it definitely disrupts the show. So you're going to be less likely to decide to do that, you know, and you and it it's you know, it took me a year to get there now. I did this before there were digital boards. So, and I, I had forgotten all about it. I was talking to a, a guy, actually the guy that drove us home from the airport also runs a sound company. And we had this conversation and he's like, yeah, but remember you did it back before there were digital boards. He's like, I bet you brought your own mixer to gigs. I'm like, right. I totally forgot. <laughs> I would bring a little mixer and run the, the mon the single, you know, mono monitor feed from the, from the board. So whatever that had in it, which was usually just vocals, you know, that I would get, and then I would add my own stuff in, probably a little bit more of my vocal, maybe an overhead mic or something to capture some drums and stage wash and, you know, get it going from there. But yeah, I had a separate mixer on stage with me every night. And uh, and then obviously the digital boards with all the outputs and individual mixes and, you know, tweaks exactly like you want, stereo panning and like all those things. But it it took me a year to get to the point where I was comfortable and I wanted it like I was I was I was a cheerleader for in years before I ever had them and it still took me a year to get to the point where it was like I could show up at a gig and just play you know it's like no big deal this is how it is I'm always using them I mean unless the unless it's just impossible and then I'll deal but uh, you know otherwise yeah well that's great man I'm stoked ah, it's good news see I knew yeah. you'd cheer me up thank you that's good there you go so South by Southwest I we talked a little bit about it um, before it, cause I, I did a hybrid this year where I did uh, some of South by Southwest remotely from home. And then, uh, and then I left and, and went to Austin and it was sublime to be able to be there and amongst people and seeing live music. And the best part about South by Southwest is the serendipity. You know, I'll, I'll put things on my schedule and then just sort of flow from one to the other based on what's happening in the moment or, or all of that. Um, I saw, I, well, I saw a bunch of bands, which I want to talk about. I saw two more movies and I hope both of them make it out. I think they will, you know, with all the streaming options these days, uh, more and more of these things make it, you know, it's, it's, it's not as common as it used to be for them to just like premiere at South by and then never be seen again. So I think they'll mo both make it. There was one called jazz fest, a new Orleans story, which was a documentary about uh, Jazz Fest, its origins and and how it all works. And it, it had some fantastic, uh, just really nice moments in it. And they're very much looking forward to being back this year after being off for, for several years. Mm -hmm. um, so I highly recommend that movie when it comes out, Jazz Fest, A New Orleans Story. And then the other one that I went to see, uh, music related, that kind of surprised me was called Dio Dreamers Never Die. And it was a documentary about Ronnie James Dio who was born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 10 minutes from, from where I live here. I, there was so much about Dio. I did not know. Um, mm, I didn't, I didn't know he was, a, he was American. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. That's a step one. Yeah. <laughs> no, he was, you know, he, um, I think he grew up over in New York state, but, um, but yeah, very much an American. <laughs> no, no question about that. And, and just had a fantastic career. Uh, he was in doo-wop bands in the fifties and uh, obviously then he was in black Sabbath and, and then, you know, had his own band. Rainbow. What's that? Blackmore's Rainbow. Oh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, too. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, but just a fascinating guy. I, I, For some reason, I had always written him off. I knew he had a great voice, but I didn't, I didn't understand him. And he's so much more than I, I ever gave him credit for. And the movie was really, really well done. So hopefully it, it, it makes it out. I, I, again, I think this one really will. It was, it was, it was well done. And, um, just tells us, tells a story that I didn't know existed. So, which is, you know, that's the point of these documentaries, right? To learn something. So, um, bands wise, uh, there were, it, it was, this was, I could, it's been many years and I'm not counting the two years of South by Southwest that I missed because the last time it happened was 2019, right? South by was the first sh big show in the U S to be canceled because of COVID in early March of, of uh, 2020. So it didn't happen in 20 or 21. Uh, but even the, the years prior 2019, 2018, 2017 had, had changed. Things had evolved in a way with the music festival that, the amount of serendipitous moments that I experienced was not nearly what it was in the past. And this time really felt like it went back to a really, for me, a really good mix of bands and, and artists whose names I knew before South by ever started. And then just discovering those artists that I had no idea who they were and and you know be, being fully immersed and fully entertained uh, of the the people that I knew there I got to see Katie Tunstall who I'd never seen before she is a fantastic performer mm. uh, really like just like super engaging with a crowd it was just her and an acoustic guitar she did some looping and and things like that but she just knocked it out of the park I saw that band Wet Leg which is uh, a newer band I forget where they're from uh, but. Uh, they, 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 they're, they're like the hot new band. Um, they, it reminded me of trying to get to see like vampire weekend or the Alabama shakes at South by Southwest, you know, the, as the week progressed, the lines got longer for, for this band. Um, so they were interesting. I got to see, I Dream don't even know how that works anymore. You know, the, the hot new band, right? Yeah. Alabama shakes was that. Yep. And and they're not really in my life, right? I was, you know, it was, it was interesting to watch because it was all of a sudden this, this phenomena that you have been told is going to be the Black Pumas was another one of those, right? Yeah, they weren't. A, I didn't see them at South by, but they were another one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it's kind of interesting. And, and my question would be, you go to South by. What's the what's the main? You know, it used to be a little bit. Is it still connected to your day job stuff, or is it a music event for you, or is it a you know? Honestly, and I ask this question because because the concept of am I seeing the big new thing? And, and, you know, to me, my perspective, a slight detour, you know, my perspective is South by is this really interesting, eclectic thing put on by a really, really good guy and a great team that got very, very interesting, more interesting, hyperbolically interesting when Twitter kind of, you know, made its presence originally known at at South by then it became a tech event. The, well, it, yeah, the interactive event earned its reputation because Twitter launched there. That's right. But even and, and but then, prior and then to every that, every startup wanted to launch there. Right. But so there's the there's three really technically four festivals that happen sort of simultaneously. There's the music festival. There's the what they call South by Southwest Interactive, which is this tech festival. There is the film festival which sort of spans everything. And then there is the South by Southwest uh, education thing. Uh, so three main festivals, but four, if you include education and, and to answer your question, it, it sort of, it, you know, I, my content job these days, but it's been this way, even before we sold off Mac observer, you know, is that my content's been my three podcasts, right? This one, Mac geek gab and the small business show. And I got, 
content for for every one of those shows at South by it's it's almost like they built a conference for me right because it's it's got like the the business stuff it's got the tech stuff and it's got the music stuff which is which is great and it's and the and the films are the same way i've got you know, i mentioned a couple films here and a couple of films uh, last episode we did but I saw, you know, probably 10 films and, you know, two of them were tech related and three of them were business related. And, you know, you'll hear about those on my other shows. So it 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 very much fits. I would say, though, that of the three main, you know, facets to the festival, tech, the, the interactive one is probably the least interesting in general. But there are moments of that which also completely shine. Uh, you know, it just depends on the year. It depends on the the subject matter that that comes up. There there have been years where it got like post Twitter launching there because it had existed for many years prior to that, and it was actually pretty good. And then post Twitter launching there, everybody started treating it like, oh, this is where you have to do your activations. Yeah. This is you know, and it got a little overdone. There's still some of that kind of trickling, but it's not well, it's not like it was. It's not overdone. Well, like let me this. ask a question. Yeah. I, I would think the thing that the, the the fertile ground for that that meets so many of those criteria would be the area crypto. Is crypto everywhere at South by? Crypto was in a lot of different ways in South by. In fact, um, I saw the, the best use of it that I saw was Dolly Parton, believe it or not. So first of all, I got to see Dolly Parton, which was friggin oh. amazing. In a in the the Austin City the AC Alive Moody Theater, which holds I don't know about maybe twenty five hundred people, great theater. That's where I saw Green Day all those years ago. Um, right. Yep. And uh, Dolly uh, and James Patterson, the author, just put out a book called Run Rose Run. And James, it was this was sort of James's idea. He had reached out to Dolly. I'm getting to the crypto part of this. Trust me. Uh, he had reached out to Dolly and said, I have this idea for, a, you know, another thriller because it's a James Patterson book. That's what he does. He sold like 400 million of them, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and he said, uh, but I want to base it in Nashville about a, a songwriter in Nashville. And, I, you know, I, I want to partner with you. And and when she got the note from her agent or whatever that James Patterson wanted to talk to her, she's like, well, he doesn't need me to sell books like he's already got that covered. And, but she's like, oh, I'll be nice. I'll I'll you know, I'll talk to him. And so they talked and he explained this idea to her and uh, she went and wrote like seven songs that night to to start telling that side of this story. And the, the two of them and Connie Britton, who was in like Friday Night Lights and those other things, the, the, the three of them had a conversation at the Moody Theater talking about this book and the genesis of it. And it was a fantastic conversation. I'm eager now to read the book. It sounds like it's it's quite good. In fact, I've talked to some people who've read it who say it's awesome because it's a James Patterson book. And, you know, then he used the Dolly helped kind of fill in the Nashville parts of it. And uh, and but she also wrote what is effectively the soundtrack for this book, because that's how she creates. You know, she she writes mm -hmm. songs. And so it was a conversation amongst the three of them for, I don't know, about 45 minutes. And then uh, Dolly told us all, she said, um, I'll be back in about 15 minutes if you have to pee. And they changed over the stage and she brought her entire band out, uh, including three harmony singers, uh, you know, but pedal steel player, guitar, bass, drums, keys, like, the, you know, the whole the whole works. And she put on about an hour long set and it was spectacular. The first three songs were from this record, Run Rose Run. And even though I hadn't heard those before, they were all like instant earworms, you know, because it's Dolly. She knows what she's doing. And and then it was just a set of hit after hit after hit. And she was telling stories. She sounds like Dolly Parton has always sounded like it, she was whip smart. <laughs> One of my favorite things was somebody from the crowd between songs yelled up, I love you, Dolly. And her response to him instantly was, I love you too, but I told you to wait in the truck, which was perfect. <laughs> Great way to shut it down. And, uh, but it was just a spectacular show. But the fascinating part about it was that it was also uh, the first use of, and therefore a promotion of uh, this, what this company Blockchain Creative Labs is doing. Uh, they partnered with Eluvio, E-L-U-V -E dot I-O, which is a a built as a blockchain for musicians uh, 
for things like, and, and you could use, I mean, you can use a blockchain for anything. The, the general idea of a blockchain is that anything that happens, any transactions that happen on it are public and therefore are sort of vetted by the public. So if, if I were to send you something on a blockchain, it doesn't matter. It could be a Bitcoin, could be an NFT, could be a concert ticket, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, the whole world knows that I sent that to you. So I can't say, oh, it's still mine. It's like, nope, it's, it's a public on the chain that this transfer happened and all of that. And so Alluvio and uh, Blockchain Creative Labs have built their own blockchain to leverage that concept, which is effectively NFTs, for uh, ticketing for events. They streamed Dolly's whole event on the blockchain. Uh, everyone there was able to get a proof of attendance NFT, but it, it was, I mean, it was free tickets uh, if you could get them. But, you know, you could also do this with ticketing. You could do it with albums. You could do it with films, eBooks, any, you know, collectibles, whatever you want to do. And the nice part about this is because it's their own blockchain, you, you know, you if, if you've dug into NFTs at all, you may have heard that because they're on the Ethereum blockchain, that the fees to, to even get started with an NFT can be, you know, $10,000. That's just the fees. That's not going to work for a band like, say, Bitter Pill or Fling, who might want to sell their stuff. You know, like we don't have fans that are going to pay 10 grand in mm -hmm. fees. Well, this one, there's no fees or the fees are extremely low. And so you get to do all of this stuff without the, the weight of the, you know, the, the typical Ethereum or, or Bitcoin blockchain. And so it, it's a, it's a cool thing being able to do this stuff. And I, I, I was fascinated that I, I'm glad I went to this event, a, cause I got to see Dolly, but I also got to talk to these people and, and really learn about what they're doing. I was like, Oh, I want to tell our listeners about this. So I, I've put links to all this in our, our show notes here. Very cool. Yeah, but yeah, crypto was was big this time around for sure. You know, there were there were lots of little events and it was like, oh, you go and get your, you know, proof of attendance NFT and you know, this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, okay, that's fine. Um couple other bands I want to mention. Really just one. Um I, I'll put the whole list on uh in the show notes. And if you have questions about any of them, feel free to ask me. But I'm always excited when I run into a band that I've never heard of and blows me away. And the band creamer was that I have no idea why they wound up on my schedule. I like, I have no memory of checking the box of like, yes, I want this band uh, or I want to potentially go see this band. Like I said, I, I fill my schedule with all kinds of things and then just sort of go with the flow in, in the moment. I had to scooter myself. Thankfully, there's bird and lime scooters all over Austin for South by Southwest, which really makes things, it changes the whole game. But I had to scooter myself probably three quarters of a mile east on 6th Street. So, you know, a decent, a decent distance from downtown to this hole of a club. I mean, I got there and it was like, I don't know that this is big enough to have bands, but I'm like, it seems like the name is right. Okay. You know, so I go in, they're not even checking South by badges. It's like, is this even a South by event? Like what's happening here? I get in, it's crammed. I have no idea where the stage might be. And suddenly I turn a corner and it's like, okay. So there was a stage there, Paul, but there were, uh, five people on stage, the, the drummer and the singer slash guitar one player, were in the center of the stage and you could see them. And then anybody uh, on stage right or stage left was hidden by the mains uh, because of how narrow the stage was. Mm -hmm. uh, but this band, it, it, the singer, part of like the description of it that, that I, you know, saw in the thing said, you know, he's people, were, uh, he reminds people of Freddie Mercury and he does, he has that kind of voice. He's got that kind of range, but it's like you took, uh, Alex Chilton from, you know, big star and that sort of pop sensibility and married it with like some queen, you know, whatever you want to call them, proggy art rock sensibility with twists and turns. And the keyboard player is also, um, is, is the brother of Philip Creamer, who's the singer. So you get these like beetle harmonies, but are, who are, which are sung by brothers. So you get those family harmonies, the blood harmonies. Mm -hmm. And it Coffers was brothers. what's that? like the Coffers brothers. Yeah, exactly. Or like bitter pill where you get father and daughter. Uh, and it was just sublime uh, in the sound engineer. It, I mean, this club was tiny, like the room I'm in now where I record my podcast is definitely bigger than the place where 
uh, where this band played, but it was just great. I mean, they mixed it perfectly. You could hear all the harmonies. You could hear all the twists and the turns and the music and everybody played their asses off too. So like I was just blown away. And then, so I got back to my, you know, I just watched this. It happened to be the last gig of the night that whatever the night that was, I think it was after I saw Dolly, I, I bounced over to this club and, and saw it. And then I went back and researched like, okay, who the heck is this? And it turns out that the band that I said all of this stuff about when I saw South by South was 2019, a band called the Texas Gentleman, uh, which was my favorite discovery that year. It's the same family. It's a father and son in that band. And in fact, the keyboard player uh, of of the Creamer band is the lead singer of the Texas Gentleman. <laughs> so Funny. it was like, ah, oh, it seems I got something for this family here. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was so, they were so good. So I highly recommend checking them out. They've got videos and stuff. So again, the links are in the show notes. But um, yeah, it was like it was it was great to be able to go and and you know experience this and and do it all again and have it be such a positive thing that that worked the way i like it to work where it's just the serendipity of the moment sort of flows from one thing to the next so love yeah. it dave it was good it was good yeah we're 46 minutes are we doing more or are we uh saving things for next week um let's start this little thing that i was telling you about pre-show okay. and just see if uh if we put a cap on it or if it's needs sure. to be opened up a little bit more yeah yeah I've been thinking about the concept of of um, competition as as to how it as to how it what its place is in our in our band life. So y- you and I are slightly different about this in our in our band view, and maybe this is you know tangentially related to our perspectives of of being a how I lead bands and you know how you join sure. bands. But I was thinking that you know. Competition is an essence of of running the business of being in a cover band. I've seen posts from people on various boards like, nope, all musicians got to support each other. You know, there's plenty of gigs to go around. I get, and in some in some parts of the country or the world, maybe there are plenty of gigs to go around. I've not experienced that. There's a finite number of gigs. There's a finite number of good gigs, the better paying gigs, right? It all whittles down to, sure. you know, what's better. There's a finite number of weekends in the year, finite number of weekend days in the year. I mean, and, you know, you are, you are, you are just the fact that if two people want it, that's a competitive nature. Now, sure. competition doesn't have to be an evil, you know, bare knuckle brawling thing. Sure. But it is. It is what you do with the concept of competition. I don't understand the people who deny that that, that there's any competition involved in it at all. I mean, I, again, you don't you don't have to hate the person you're competing against. That's, sure, that's, you know, and right. I think that's uncomfortable for a lot of musicians who view it purely as art. And maybe this all goes to that bigger conversation about is it art or is it business? And you know, that's I would both. say if you're, I mean, there's nothing you're wrong with money for it, right? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with with having art as a business, right? I mean, yeah. you, you know, you can. You can be true to your art and still properly treat it as a business. I, I don't. I don't have a problem with that. Like, like those two things very much can, and I think in many ways should exist together because otherwise you can't support yourself doing art. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it's the same thing. Just saying business is not a dirty word, even no. if you are an artist and aren't comfortable with it. You know. If if you what you do has value, there's a transaction of of some kind of absolutely um, yeah wampum yeah you want to get paid you know. right you want to get paid for the gig that's business there you go yeah 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 so <clears throat> I I uh, and to me I'm a fairly competitive human being and so you know I also I I won't do anything in the interest of winning but I do like to win right so sure you know I, I like we've had the conversation about how bands say, you know, the, the greatest, this band in this area. And we're like, really the greatest, you know, like, like I'm proud of my band, but I will never, I will never get schlocky from a marketing perspective in the interest of winning. I will never say anything before it's real, hopefully. Mm. And so, you know, I like to sleep at night. And so, you know, I, I try to maintain some amount of, of principle in the way I go about my competition, but I, I think it's competition. And this is this is why my hair gets up, you know, when when other band leaders sniff around our band, you know, trying to poach guys. I think that's a that's a poaching issue, right? And that kind of goes into again, 
I, and you and I have had this, and it was probably as contentious a conversation we've ever had, right? I do not own the guys who play in my group, but I do think in the spirit of gentlemanly competition, band leaders should, you know, respect that some guys built something and, you know, because the, the net net of competition is like, it's not only about, you know, who gets the gig, right? The net net is, is I get offered a lot of gigs I can't take. Who am I going to refer them to? The people who I work with the best. Right. And hopefully refer stuff back to me. That's part of competition as well. Who do you partner with to make your competitive position stronger? So I, I don't know. You, you have any thoughts on this? Again, you and I are, are we are so aligned in many ways because we know each other for so long. We've yeah. learned from each other. But But you have always treated competition as a less uh, blood sport activity than I believe you do in your, in your, in your day job life. Actually, it's, the, it's all the same for me. It, it really, right. yeah, it, because I have, I, I mean, I lead, I lead a very charmed life. Let me just say that right out of the gate. Um, so anything I say is from a position of, of privilege. Now, some of that privilege I've created for myself some of it has happened serendipitously and some of it's just sort of baked in. Uh, however, I have found that the best success I've ever had has been in helping lift other people up. So anything I can do, I mean, you know, the, the Backbeat Media, right, is a company that exists because our competition told us they wanted it to exist, right? When we started, we started Mac Observer, we figured out how to host our site, we figured out how to sell the ads, and then our competitors came to us and was like, we just want to publish our sites, can you do the rest for us? And I was like, oh, uh, sure, you know, and, and but that takes a lot of trust, too, in both directions. Like, the, the, they're going to trust me because I'm going to know things about their business that I could potentially have used to, you know, leverage Mac Observer up above them. But I also knew, well, if I do that, then that's the, that's the end of this particular path. You know, now I'm on my own again. I don't like being on my own. So I like, I like having the support of a community. I like being uh, involved in a community without it being contentious. And so, like, I very much am of the mindset of like, yeah, okay, this one little thing that's happening right here, I'm not entirely happy with. And that happens occasionally, you know, where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, like the the analog would be someone in a band I play in starts playing for a band that, you know, we effectively compete for gigs for. Because I agree with you, like if there's one gig, then, you know, you're competing for that slot or a slot at a gig, you're competing for that slot. That's just a reality. And so when I see that happen or I see a band that, you know, that that we our, our peers with or whatever, get a gig that we would have wanted. It's always like, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel that twinge of, of competition is like, oh, I want to win that one next time, that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. it doesn't stop me from supporting what everybody else is doing. In fact, it, it almost encourages me to, because it's like, well, if that band got in over there, um, I mean, I, m mainly I like to help people, but I can also be, you know, selfish about it and say, well, if I help them, then, you know, when things come around and they are asked who else should do it, well, Dave was the guy or Dave's band, you know, was one of the ones that helped them. So people will say nice things, you know, as opposed yeah. to Dave's that guy that that's always out for, you know, out for blood. I don't know, you know. So I, I, I and I, I know there are times when I've been uh, opportunistic about things like that, but in general, I just sort of default to if I can, if I can lend a hand, if I can, you know, offer advice or whatever. I mean, that's like been my whole career. It's what we do here. It's the same, yeah. you know, it's all the same. So, so yeah, I, I, I definitely am competitive, but I've found that playing the long game and supporting, you know, the, the, the people with whom I'm competing has actually paid off better for me than when I don't support them. I would say that there's a where we're different is our interpretations of the shades of gray between being the a hole competitive yeah. person and being the a competitive person. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Being the non competitive person, like, right. like, yes, I, I, you know, enjoy supporting other bands and would like to have a strong circle of mutually mutually supportive. And you know, I support some people who aren't even mutually supportive. Sure, I definitely toss. Toss multiple gigs to bands who have never returned the favor. Oh yeah, I do that all the time. It, but it's fine. Like I, I, 
I don't know. I tell myself it's just, well, that's the karma bank. It'll come back somewhere else on the other side. And it does, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, my perspective is, is mostly a reaction to the people who just say we should all just support each other all the time anyway. And I would just say, you know, somewhere around the, you know, keep your friends close, keep your enemies close. I mean, so, so whatever your philosophy is on this, but just don't deny the fact that, that it's a zero sum game. There are a finite number of weekend days or a finite number of gigs in most markets. Again, I, I've heard, I've seen people say there's plenty of gigs. I've never, I've also seen people in those same markets, you know, say they're not getting the money they want or, you know, whatever it is, it, you know, the, the pyramid builds there, there, there probably are in some markets, a lot of bad gigs or okay gigs in some markets, they're going to be more corporate gigs and other, you know, where there are more corporations, there'll be more corporate gigs than others, yep. better paying gigs, whatever your, whatever your definition of the pyramid that you're trying to climb is to, you know, achieve success in your, with your band. Again, there's a whole artistic part of that. You know, how good is your band? You know, that's, that's one type of thing. And there's competitive aspects to doing that, right? Have you put, have you, have you selected the very best people to give you the best team to go into competition with? Sure. And, and best can, again, best, you know, I'm the first to say best is not always the it's subjective. Yeah. The most, per, yeah, the most, well, uh, is subjective, <laughs> but, but you, my friend said, you know, that two drummers were better than two other drummers. I was sitting there listening to say <laughs> that they're, they're all good drummers, right? You know, yeah, they, yeah, like yeah. You know, better than Charlie, like better than Charlie in the stones. <laughs> well, well, that's the so, difference, right? Yeah. Steve Jordan changes the stones dramatically. It is not right. the same stones. Right. But yeah, there's no better. Sure. Right. Yeah. It's it's preference. Anyway, I, I do want to. I want to. I, I, I want to pick one point though, because I I I very much do not believe that playing in bands and playing music and having a career playing in music is a zero sum game. I, I I absolutely refute that. So I I understand you may believe it because you said it, but I am not on board with that at all. I I I I even when there's you know, there's one slot to be had on Friday night at that club and one band gets it over another. That's not a zero sum game. If that band that go, that gets it goes in, plays well, draws people that helps the scene. Right. So that's good for everybody that moves things along. And who knows? It might be someday I'm playing with that person, you know, 10 years down the road. And so that's not a zero sum game at all. Even, you know, either either zooming way out or zooming way in. Like there's there's yeah. a lot of ways to look at things that there's benefits for everyone. And you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. So yeah, I don't I don't see it as a zero sum game, but I, I do I do want to win, you know. I, I feel you, you know, you, you are you are very good at a long at playing long games. But I would say to me It's the only thing I lost a gig. Playing a long game. <laughs> uh, I I'd question that. But anyway, um <laughs> I would say if I lost a gig that I wanted, I would say, all right, that's a loss. What sure. am I going to do to fix it and win next time? Right. Yeah. You know, what am I going to do? We you know what do I got to do better? And yeah, it is good. I do want all the bands in my, in my pool to be good and make, you know, that's my long game is I do want a vibrant music scene. And, and, and I would say the opposite is what happens is, is like, I am mystified when, subpar bands have have more gigs and subpar meaning musically performance yeah. wise you know have their act together to market their own shows there, there's a there's a club that we're playing now and uh there's a band that that gets a gig there they they don't they they haven't drawn right sure if that club if that club goes out of business because they keep booking you know this band for whatever reason they book it yep I lose right that's, yeah, that's, that's sure, one of my favorite sure. places to play yeah, everybody right? loses so, that's right yeah. yeah I guess it I guess it's a glass half full you know it's, it's it's the optic that you're looking into the problem with like like I get it yes long game is important and you know and wanting a scene to be vibrant and healthy is a smart business decision as well as a smart artistic decision but. Um, in every skirmish, and again, competing for one slot on one night, if I lose it and there's something I can learn so I can win it next time, that just helps me run my band better. And at the end of the day, remember, I, here's my long game. If, if I don't keep good musicians working, they're going to get busy with other things. So if I lose too many of those Friday, good Saturday night you know, gigs at sure. a good club, you know, that's part of keeping a band together is keeping them working and keeping and keeping it vibrant for them. So yeah, but that person who got they, that, that gig that you didn't get, maybe they'll bring you on as an opening act the next time. 
right? Again, it's not, I, I, it's not a blood sport. It's, it's not that I yeah. wish them well. And, you know, that's all cool. But I just want to know if, if that particular competition for that particular slot, if I lose it, if I win it, you know, I feel like I'm the smartest guy in the world and everything I'm doing is correct. And, you know, that that's why we want it, right? I, I put the right band together with the right set list and the right show and, the you know, all this type of stuff. If I lose it, I want to know, you know, what, why I lost it or didn't get it. You know, lost might be too harsh sure. uh, a perspective into it. But I would want to, you know, keep tweaking and keep improving. There's also a, a certain understanding that not every band is great for every gig. My band doesn't phys- physically fit into many places. So there might be a really hot club. If I can't get my band on a stage and I have to put half the band on the floor just to say I played that club, that's not a win. Right. So you got to be smart about what you consider a win. But I just more like the, the fundamental idea here is when I see musicians say everybody should support everybody, everybody's wonderful, I, I see a, a different angle to that. Like, Yes, respect all, you know, be a good human being, wish all well, take care of your own business and, you know, and, and be the best band that you can be in all ways. And then, you know, use that to justify your mission to go out and be as successful as you can. How's that? Yeah, I, yeah, I, it's, it's a little too cutthroat for me, but. But I'll take it. That's, I mean, it's I, like we all have a different way of approaching it. I, I'd, I'd much rather just lift somebody up and and know that it will come back around because it always has. You know, it do doesn't. You lift somebody up. Do you lift somebody up who isn't serious about their their professionalism? Do you lift somebody up who? I mean, I might who, point out to them like, hey, you know, here here's like we do on this show, right? Right? Like you know, the conversations we have about about making sure you're getting paid the right thing for your gigs and all that stuff, like. Yeah. People, some people don't, they don't know because they don't know. And some of that is driven by the eagerness to play, right? A lot of the, and, we, and it, this is not, not a new topic for us, but you know, there's those people that are so eager to play, they're willing to play for $12 and nachos, right? You know, and it's yeah. like, yeah, that hurts the whole thing. And it's like, slow down a little bit. You know, you have value. Your, your value isn't all that much different than that band's value or that band's value. So think about this, put yourself, lift yourself up to that. Don't drag them down with you. And a lot of people yeah. don't, you know, don't even know that. Now, are there some that are, are just like, I don't want, I don't want to say intentionally malicious cause that's probably a little too far, but something along those, you know, chosen ignorance. I don't want to know. I just want to do my thing and screw the rest of the world. Right. And like those people, if I've, if someone doesn't want help, I can't help them. Right. And so I'm happier to just help the people that want help. And, and, and then I get helped when I want help. And it's, you know, it's, it's, I think a lot of humility in that game is a good thing because there's always something to learn from, from every musician I encounter. Right. And it, it may be, they're going to teach me how to play a certain thing. They may teach me how not to play a certain thing, right? Like, but you know, there's always something to learn and it might be, you know, this is how you approach this kind of club. This is the sort of thing you do. Ah, oh, okay. All right. You know, I can learn from that. That sounds good. So, yeah, I, don't, I mean, but I, 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 I get competitive. I, I want those gigs. I, you know, it was driving us crazy that we weren't getting gigs at like, like for example, Bitter Parallel has a gig uh, coming up at the Stone Church. Right. Super excited about that. It drove us bonkers that we couldn't get in there. We'd all played in there in different bands. We would, you know, we know that, I mean, we sell out places in the seacoast that are larger than that. It's like, why are they ignoring us? I know the owners, like what's happening here. It, it took yeah. a long time, you know, but it, it like, it wasn't, I didn't begrudge the bands that were getting gigs there. It was like, okay, what are, what do we need to do differently to position ourselves to make this work, you know, and, and sometimes it's nothing. There's no yeah. answer. You just have to, you know, persistence is, is the, the key to that. And, you know, as someone who is schooled in playing the long game, persistence is a big part of that. It's just like, all right, you know what? Stay the course. Don't be a jackass about it. Don't take it the wrong way. Don't act like your butt hurt. Even if you're feeling butt hurt, you know, just, okay. Yep. Hey, we'd still love to play there. If you got an opening, let us know. You know, a little bit of humility and eventually, hey, the phone rang, you know, so, um, and I say the phone rang, Billy took care of all of it. Like, I, I don't want to yeah. take credit for this, but, um, but I, I know that's how he handled that it was just like, you know, like, okay, well, we'll just stay on it. It's fine. We know that we're going to be good for that venue and someday they'll know it and it, it's all going to work. So, 
I don't Fair know. Enough. Yeah. It's an interesting conversation though. I, I mean, I don't mean to say that my, my way of going about it is very much right for me. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily say that it's the, the only, it's certainly not the only way you've had great success with a, a, a modified version of this. I don't, I don't, I don't think, yeah, I don't think, there, I don't think there is any one way. It, it's, no. it's what matches your personality. Yeah. yeah. I just think that you can, you can acknowledge that competition is an aspect of running a band. Absolutely. You know, and, and then what, whatever that means to you is up to you. But I, I just think to deny that, that it is a fact of life, a fact of the business part of accepting money for your art. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. you know, I just think it ex existed. Yeah. Oh, it, you know, it's definitely a competitive thing. It's just how it works. Yep. I mean, it, it, of course it is. It's like, it's how it goes. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, this was good. Fun. We're over an hour today, man. We had a lot to say. Good stuff. Good stuff for sure. Folks, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. What, what works for you? What, you know, this is a nuanced conversation. Paul, you and I aren't really that far off. Where where do you fall into this, folks? Let us know. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I'm glad to be back home. <laughs> what is it we say? Always be performing. Always, 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 always be performing. <laughs>